Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I am the host of this show. And you know, every week I get to talk to smart CEOs, founders, entrepreneurs of all kinds of companies and organizations ranging from, you know, Netflix, the Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activision Blizzard, Lending Tree, Open Table, Axe Software, and many more. I'm also the co-founder of Rise My Vibe, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And my guest this week is Eden Jalat, and she is a crisis communications expert. She's been called the dumpster fire fixer, which I just absolutely love that d- description. How memorable is that? She runs a strategic communications firm that manages the optics and messaging both in and outside of the media's glare from celebrity scandals and corporate fraud to criminal and civil litigation. And she works with business owners, board members, and attorneys to tell their side of the story when the proverbial SHIT is hitting the fan. She's written three books on crisis management and also done TEDx talks and she frequently appears on TV and in print, including ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, Access Hollywood, and a host of other locations. And of course, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25 Media, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcasts and content marketing. And if you're listening to this and wondering whether you should do a podcast, I've told everyone that I think they should as well. So go check out rise25media.com or email us at support at rise 25 Media and happy to help you out. All right, Eden, pleasure to have you here. And Hi, um, you. yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about this. What's more fun than celebrity scandals and crisis and all that kind of stuff? And you've got clients that call you when they're pulling up to their house and there's a bunch of media cameras out front and crazy stories yeah. like that. Um, but let's start with uh, you had a client that was a founder of a company and kind of a classic case of a founder where they kind of start to use the, the company like a piggy bank but then the company outgrows them. And then you've got a board and then the board start looking at th- starts looking at things and it turns out there's a lot of kind of lining in their pockets. I think we've all seen stories like this in, in the news. And, and you were brought in by the board to help figure out how to navigate the way forward. Tell us how, how that played out. Yeah, so this is actually something that's super common both with for-profit companies and with nonprofit companies. But as you were saying, we were brought in by the board and it was trying to figure out, you know, can we keep this person? If we do, how does that look? If we let that person go, how are we able to do this? If we do that, you know, do we file suit against this person? Like, how do we, so actually one of the interesting things about the founder was, and actually this happens quite often, is when the company is built around the individual, right? It's kind of hard to imagine if you take that individual away, will that company or organization be able to exist without that person? Yeah, or and if you if have like donors, maker, donors yeah. right? You know, like, is that going to crumble because everyone had a relationship with this person, even if, right. you know, they thought that person was on the up and up? And so it's interesting, actually, with the boards, because you get something like this, where you get some people who are like, oh, of course they did this. I knew something was kind of fishy. I just didn't say anything. Like, we have to get rid of this person. They'll be like one part of the board. And then the other part of the board's like, but I've known this person for so long. Right? And they're and probably even if, brought in by that person. And Yeah. And even if they get the report back you know, the investigative report and they go, well, actually, you know, this person has been lining their pockets, you know, they spent $4,000 on a shuffleboard table and called it biz dev, you know, even though they have these cold hard numbers in their face, they're still like, but I go golfing with this person. Our kids grew up together. We've known them for so long. It's actually really hard to get all of the board to align and go, this must be the best path forward. So we always start with what is the goal of the organization, right? So working with the board, you know, we always go like, what is the goal? And the goal is for this one was to protect the company. And so when we were going through, you know, do we keep this person? Do we not keep this person? How do we let this person go? I was like, if the goal is to protect the company or the organization, what is the best path forward for this? You always have to tie it back, remind them when they start straying off and going, right. well, but mm, I don't know. It's, and bring them back to, to protect it. Yeah. yeah the goal is reminding them the or- why. Right, right, right. And, you know, um, I wanted to ask you about 
you, you know, when you're dealing with things that are in the media or things that are in the public narrative, everyone has a different opinion. Everyone has a different subjective belief about, you know, what is out there and what information is out there. And, and that can make it really challenging to debate with people when they have strongly held opinions about, you know, the way that something is discussed, which is influenced, especially these days, by where we gather our information. You know, you might have some board members who are Fox News watchers and other board members who are CNN watchers, and they, they have a completely different uh, perspective on the world. So how do you navigate those paths when you have people with, you know, that need to come together, wildly different worldviews of, of what yeah. the media narrative is or can be? Yeah, I was actually just talking about that with somebody else in my industry recently, because it used to be, you know, there are, no matter what happens, there are going to be people who will not believe you. No matter what happens, you could say, you know, the sky is blue when it's actually blue, and they will just be like, I don't think so, right? So you're never going to convince the people who are just out to just go, uh uh, no matter what you do. There are going to be the people that absolutely love you, no matter what you do, unless you do something completely egregious. And you're usually playing towards the middle, right? The people who haven't made up their minds. But now, recently, just everyone is so divided, it is becoming increasingly hard to kind of play towards that middle. But what I have found is if you can start with well, one listening and not getting super defensive about stuff, so listening to where they're coming from, because you usually can find some sort of commonality or middle ground. And if you can get the other side or some, not necessarily that it's the other side, but if you can get people to agree that, you know, you do have commonalities, you can work based on that. Got but if it. you're basically just coming out straight from the gate, you're wrong, this thing, you know, people start getting right. really defensive and they're going to shut down and not listen to anything else you have to say. And now when you're trying to um, help, you know, a board or a company or a law firm to figure out what that goal is, what, what you can all agree on, what the goal is from a crisis communication standpoint, um, I imagine one of the big pieces first is, is this realistic? You know, is this a realistic goal? Like if it's already out in the news, we can't just completely wipe it away. It won't completely mm -hmm. go away. So how do you, um, you know, get them to understand what's realistic and what's not? Based on experience from past client work that I've had, right? So for example, if somebody comes to me and they're like, you know, um, actually somebody just called me yesterday and they were like, you know, the story came out last week. I want it to go away. And I was like, well, the reporter had reached out to you before it was even published. Like they were going, you know, this is, these are some things that we've heard. These are some things that we've seen. Do you have a comment on the situation? Yes, the questions were slanted a little bit towards, you know, this organization being made out to be the bad guy. Um, and then they refused to answer the reporter. And then it came out and they were like, well, we wish it would be taken down. And I was like, well, you had the opportunity to shape the narrative and tell your side of the story when they reached out to you. And yes, reporters had their like list of questions that, you know, based on what they've read, I can understand why they have these questions. Um, so in terms of shaping the narrative and coming out and going like, you know, is this realistic? No, you cannot undo a story that came out a week ago, but you can go, all right, well, based on what we have now, it's, you know, for this organization, it was like, well, how is this impacting the current employees that you have? How is this impacting the donors? the investors, right, the people that are your various stakeholders, you know, have they read this story or are they upset about it? Do they need reassuring? It's trying to figure out, you know, you can't undo the past, but going forward, what do you have control over? Right. And of course, you know, with these fast moving types of stories, a lot of times you don't have all the facts, so you don't know no. everything yet. Um, how do you navigate those waters when you have a story that's unfolding and you want to get information out there? Yeah but you don't have all yeah. the facts. Yeah, so it's, it's reminding the client that, or not necessarily reminding them, but working with them and going, okay, right? So you wanna keep people informed. You don't wanna have an information void because when you do, people just start filling it in with their own thoughts and opinions and speculation. You know, you wanna make sure it's based on the facts. And sometimes when crises do hit, there are things that you don't actually know what the answers are to everything. And that's okay. You just have to go, you know, the situation is ongoing or it's developing. And letting, managing the expectations of the listeners and saying, you know, this is ongoing. We expect to have information at whatever the reasonable amount of time is. And then making sure that when you say, you know, like if you're expecting something back, a report back on Friday, that you get back to them on Friday. Same thing with you do with reporters, right? If you tell a reporter, you know, when is your deadline? I'll get back to you. And then you don't get back to them. It burns the bridge. You want to make sure that you keep your promises. Right. Now, if you have you know, different reporters that are covering different angles on the story. How do you, 
leverage those different relationships uh, in order to shape the narrative? Do you, you know, go around to the more friendly reporters? Do you kind of have in mind who's the right one to talk to? Right. How do you navigate those waters? Um, so generally, right, because it always depends as a former attorney. I'm sure you can appreciate that. Um, but usually it's going, you know, it's always beneficial to go after uh, or work with a reporter that is friendly toward you instead of going after that serial one. I find that, you know, if you are limited on time and resources, you know, going after the lead steer, right? Like, which is the newspaper or outlet that if you speak to them, everyone else is going to start following, right? You don't want to start giving, very similar to other stakeholders, you don't want to want to tell the media different sets of facts because they will figure it out and your story is going to start to fall apart if, you know, yes, for stakeholders like your employees have different interests, then your investors might, then your other board members might. But the media, I mean, you can't, you can't lie to anyone. Yeah. Definitely not to the media. Yeah. It'll bite you in the butt. Um, So let's talk about that. Giving different messages to different stakeholders, whether Mm -hmm. it's donors, employees, customers, investors, if you're giving different messages to these different communities, uh, isn't there also a risk that, that that message is going to trickle out to a different stakeholder group and that that stakeholder group, Hey, why did you, you told the investors this and you told us the employees, something else. So it is, you never want to tell completely different facts to people. Some facts are going to be more important to other groups than they are. Like your employees are going to want to know a different set of things than necessarily your investors might. You never want to say, you know, this color is red and then this color is blue. And then people are going to go, well, wait a second, which one is it? You're going to go, you know, well, you might actually find that this is the most interesting aspect, like, for example, with employees, right? Employees are always looking at it. Well, everyone's always looking at it from how does this impact me? Usually employees are like, well, how is it going to impact my job? What's going on? How does like my role within the organization change? Am I going to continue to have a job? Like what's going on from an employee standpoint? Investors are going to go, you know, is my investment still safe? What's going on from that perspective? So it's just going here are all of my facts. How am I going to filter it through the lens of who the recipient is? Yeah. Now, yeah, I know a lot you of- You also client- have to assume that they're all going to talk to each other, by the way. So you just have to assume that yeah. that's going to happen. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, any, anything you put into writing, anything that you say, just assume that someone else is going to go, wait a second, that's not what I heard. Right, right. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the, the different ways in which the different types of clients that you work with, your law firms, uh, boards, business owners, how how they're different, how they handle crises differently, or, or how you approach it differently. So, working with the attorneys, it's very much, very much based on the facts, and they're trying to figure out like what's going on. They're always looking at the legality of things, which makes sense, right? Um, and so, they're very much more on the conservative, protecting side. Then you have the business owners who are like oh my God, everything is just burning down. Can we just fix this quickly? Like, this is my baby, you know? Ah, they're usually a little bit more frazzled. And then the nonprofits are like, I had no idea that I was even doing anything wrong. I can, someone please help me, like walk me through it. Like the board members and nonprofits really want to be walked through the entire process. They want to understand how they got there and hopefully never have it happen again. The business owners are like, just stop the bleeding now. I don't really care how you do it, just do the thing. Maybe you can tell me about it later. And the attorneys are like, well, let's like protect ourselves legally. How are we going forward with this? Right, right. Now, if if I'm a business owner listening to this, you know, the obvious advice is kind of be on the straight and narrow, right? <laughs> like, don't do anything yeah. that you wouldn't want to. I remember when I went to work at the White House, I remember this was the advice they gave us oh. um, when I first interned there was mm-hmm. don't ever write or say or do anything that you wouldn't want to see in the front page of the New York Times. Yeah. And it's kind of good advice that I have been following my entire career. Beyond that, you know, is there anything else that you know, business owners listening to this should be thinking about just to prepare themselves for perhaps you know, getting caught up in a confluence of events? Uh, yeah. If they do, if that does happen to them, what they should you know, do? Other than call call you, of course, but (laughs) before anything bad happens, like the proactive side of it is, you know, finding advisors that are going to help you set up your organization or your business in a way that will limit, like talk to your attorneys, talk to your accountants and tax people, like make sure like the HR aspect of like 
don't skimp on the advisors setting up your organization because those are the things that are going to come back and bite you in the butt. And that's how people end up landing on my doorstep. A lot of times people are like, oh, I just like, I didn't think this would ever happen to me. Or like, oh, I knew I should have done this, but I didn't think that was a good investment back in the day. And now, so, yeah, so a lot of times, they, and the attorneys and the whole other host of people that kind of clean up the matter after the fact. So a lot of times that, they, they had an inkling that they should have done yeah. something a different way. Yeah. 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 Like, for example, something that I see quite often is with the books and numbers, right? So you have one person who's receiving the check is also the same person that's writing out the check. Money magically goes missing, right? So like make sure that you, you know, put separate checks and balances, you know, process, you know, processes and procedures in place that will stop the bad things from happening in the first place. And as a business owner, like you don't have to know all these things, but at least understand how can you go to an advisor who can tell you about these insights, who can go, oh, you know, like, of course, here's a list of like a hundred things you can do, but here are like the top three or the top five things that will catch, you know, it's like the 80, 20 rule. Like yeah. what are the few things that you can do now that are going to protect you the most, give you the best chances of not having to then call me. I'm curious, how often do you get calls where it's a little bit too late? And how often do you get calls where it's like, okay, you called me at the right time before this thing broke? Most people wait. It's it's kind of like going to the doctor where you're like, oh, this is kind of like a pain. I don't really know. I, I think I'm going to get better. And then it gets to that point where you're like, oh, no. And you end up in the ER. Mm. Um, most of the time, clients will come to me and they are like, something bad has already happened or something bad is like starting to happen. They knew it was going to be happening. And they're like, well, we were kind of hoping the tides wouldn't turn too much. But now it's getting to the point where we're like, oh, we really don't handle this properly right this second. How yeah, often? Usually it's. And, and how often and Mondays is Mondays are really busy. For me. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. We had a board member who was pick up for a DIY. I imagine a lot of those on Mondays. Um, did, and then how often do you, um, do you get pushback from people who are like, Oh, we can't hire a crisis communications person because that's going to, that's going to make it worse. I actually don't get too much pushback, but mm -hmm. one of the interesting things about hiring the crisis communications person is a lot of times like I am, hiding behind the scenes. People have no idea I'm around except for, you know, the attorney that I'm working with. And then, you know, the board that's hired me, whoever's like in that inner circle. Um, Cause the last thing you want to do is see, see me on an email when you're trying to say, there's nothing really to see here. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it was, it was something that I was kind of like joked about with people. And then I had explained to everyone that I was working with in my inner circle team, right. We we're working with the attorney and then they had passed along the, the talking points for a reporter. And then I ended up being CC'd on something to the Hollywood reporter. And I'm like, now they know who I am. Why am I CC'd on this email? It's funny. You know, you were, you were saying beforehand, before we started this interview, you know, that um, you've had clients where, you know, they call up and, and they say like, the, the media is outside of my house. What should I do? And you're, the advice is rather practical. It's don't go home. Don't go walk <laughs> through that throng of people up to your doorstep, especially yeah. after you did a night in jail or whatever it is that happened to them. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then this advice, you know, like BCC me, don't CC me so that yeah. you, they don't know. I'm like, involved. Don't even BCC me. Just let me forward me the thing later or just be like, Eden, it was done. I'll be like, thank you. Yeah. 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 So how often is it, it, you know, does that come up where it's uh, the advice is really pragmatic and practical. It's, it's like the, you know, don't show up at home. Don't BCC me. They take these practical steps. I think, well, it's interesting because I, so I grew up with these certain set of skills that were ingrained in me because my father taught me these skills. And I just kind of assumed that everyone has this knowledge. And apparently it's, what I think is practical is not practical for a lot of other people. Um, but even what you might think is common sense today, you know, if a crisis hits tomorrow, your brain just is all over the place. So all the things that like may have been what you would have normally considered in a time of crisis, I mean, all hell breaks loose. You can't right. count on, you know, anything other. People forget to breathe sometimes, right? A lot of times for crisis related stuff, I'm like, don't run out and just start saying a bunch of things. Take a moment, take a breath, just, calm yourself down before you start doing a bunch of things. Yeah. Well, come, sometimes it, it's, you forget. I mean, oftentimes I think we forget about this, but you know, to give a really old example from about 20 years ago before nine 11 happened, which obviously is the biggest story of last 20 years or so, but the, the summer before that, 
was the the Gary Condit scandal. And the and I don't know if people remember that, but it was, he was a member of Congress and and um, is this huge news story. And it was like all people were focusing on, um, and, and, you know, and then and then it went away because obviously, some, uh, you know, a much bigger, important um, world event happened. But you frequently see that where there is one news story that dominates the headlines and then something mm-hmm. else happens and then that one is kind of forgotten about. So is, is that for you often the case where um, you're advising your clients, give it a little time or something else will come along and it, it, it'll go away if you give it some time? There is some advising about like, just give it some time. But generally the advice is, you know, figure out who's the most important people or person to you and like, make sure you tell your side of the story. You talk to them, like pick up the phone and call them. Don't email them if you don't have to. Um, and have a conversation with them, even if it's like, you know, briefly to explain what happened and say, do you have any questions? You know, in terms of like the media cycle, it is, you know, after you've, you know, if you've done something wrong, like after you acknowledge that, you know, you did something wrong, you are sorry, this is what you're doing to fix it. You know, sometimes you do have to just lay low. And, you know, if it is in the media, Hopefully things will just kind of die down after a while. Somebody else will do something that will draw attention away from you. But even if it's not in the media, I mean, you know, if we're working with some individuals or companies, like, for example, we were working with a company and their biggest client was Disney. And yes, it did hit the news a little bit, but I was like, I don't even care if this is a one and done story. If your biggest client is Disney, I'm like, you pick up the phone and you call your rep at Disney and you explain to them, we understand what's going on. This is what we're doing to fix it. This is how we're going to make sure it never happens again. Like, what can we do to make sure that, you know, you, Disney, are protected? And it was actually interesting because we actually got on a big Zoom call with all the people and the head of the communications department at that department in Disney was like, Ian, you did an excellent job. Like, thank you so much for making my job at Disney easier by protecting and looking out for us. And that's like, great. Welcome. Yeah, that's great feedback. Um, what about um, social media? You know, how is that changing the game these days? You know, it's, it's easier than ever for something to bubble up, go viral, so to speak. Mm-hmm. It's also easier for people to respond to stories because they can tweet something out. You can record a video and upload it to YouTube. How is social media affecting crisis communications? Oh man, it is, it is really sped up everything. And one of the big things that I've noticed is it's making it so much easier for reporters to find people within a company and pick off employees and go, Hey, do you have any comments about this or what's going on? And there are employees who will love their 15 minutes of fame. And if you don't explain to the organization, you know, all of your employees, the importance of a unified message they will, they will run off and they will talk to reporters and usually mm. reporters will find them on social media. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And any other um, ramifications of social media? I mean, social media, texting, emails, people love to put stuff in writing. It is insane. And it, that is the stuff that will just come back and bite you in the butt. Yeah. And it's crazy for, you know, you, sometimes it's, it could be a really large company that has thousands of employees mm-hmm. and completely unanticipated. They hire a new, I don't know, CFO, new CEO. And it turns out three years ago, they tweeted some, you know, derogatory comment that in today's, uh, you know, landscape is, is now viewed in a different light. That sort of thing. You see mm-hmm. that a lot in the news these days. Yeah. So the- <laughs> We're also just talking about this with somebody else in my industry. It's like, well, what do we do? I think every, everyone, I think at some point has done something that like doesn't really look great or didn't age very well. Um, so how do you manage that? So as for an organization, right? Like if the person or people that you are hiring are, are going to be visible enough, right? Do some vetting, like look into what they've done and maybe, you know, maybe there are no perfect people out there, but at least go, well, here is something that might be an issue later. So at least you are yeah. aware of it so that you're not completely blindsided by something. There's a service. I imagine someone's doing that, but combing through all the social yeah. media trails for anyone who might have said something yeah. or in our podcast, right? I mean, that, we, that we're recording this in September of 2021 and they hired and fired the executive director, ho- new host of Jeopardy for something he'd yep. said on a podcast uh, a couple of years earlier. Yep. 
Yeah. I, uh, I was actually talking to a reporter at the Associated Press about that. It was like before he'd actually, it was like right after he, no, after the podcast had been discovered, but before they'd removed him as a host. And Lynn was just like, well, like, what do you think about this? And I was like, well, from Sony's perspective, like, these are the things that they need to consider. And then it was, he got removed from being the host. And then it was like, well, he's still executive producer, but what do you think about this? And I'm like, he's perceived as damaged goods at this point. I mean, I think it's just going to affect not only the show, but the people that work. The sad thing is they waited so long that it started impacting not only the audience, but the people that actually worked on the show. It's yeah, I mean, I, I didn't follow culture. too closely, but I imagine, yeah, culturally, they, people probably were really dismayed by it. I don't know if there were mm -hmm. people that were walking out or quitting in the interim, but I guess the learnings from that situation then? It's make your decisions quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, they should be based on fact. You shouldn't be acting hastily, but. Yeah. Yeah. Make your decisions quickly. That's great. Um, all right. Wrapping things up, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of gratitude. I'm a big fan of expressing gratitude, especially to peers and contemporaries, others in your industry. You've mentioned a few of them there. You mentioned your father. Who do you respect? Who do you admire that's out there doing good work? There. So. This is, I was thinking about that. I actually, I wrote a list, a long list of people. Wow. Um, There's a lot of names on that list. <laughs> and, and some of these things are like organizations that encapsulate a bunch of different people. Um, it's like a love letter to EO. We were talking about entrepreneurs organization. Like I just, I love being surrounded by other entrepreneurs and business owners. They are amazing. I love other people that are in the field of public relations, whether it's on the crisis side or on the marketing side, who just understand what's going on. I love attorneys, which is wow. That's a that's lot a of rare people, one. apparently. That's say. a rare one. <laughs> um, but I, I just, you know, I was when I was little, I was like, well, you know, if I didn't do this for a living, I was like, I wanted to be an attorney. I just love the way that their minds work. Mm. Yeah, cool, Eden. This has been great. Um, where can people go to connect with you and learn more about the work that you do? On LinkedIn, that is the best place to find me. I am constantly posting content that is valuable and insightful for other people. You know, I have three different books, one for lawyers, one for board members, and one for business owners. So my content is just whether you're a lawyer, a board member, or a business owner, maybe you could be all three, actually. You have content that will speak to you. Excellent. All right, Eden, thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.